from Las Vegas, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering IBM Insight 2015, brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to IBM Insight, everybody. This is the Cube. I'm here uh, with Paul Gillen and George Gilbert, and we're going to wrap day one. We'll be here for two days. Uh, this is the first day of Insight. We heard the keynotes this morning. Big themes by IBM, talking heavily about cognitive, uh, you know, new era. Not a ton of product stuff today. I'm expecting we're going to hear some of that uh, tomorrow, guys. But um, let me start with you, Paul. What are your thoughts on what you heard today? Well, uh, you know, if you listen to what the stock market is saying, what the analysts are saying, the 13 straight uh, quarters of declining earnings, 13 or 14, whatever it is, you would get the the impression that this is a company <clears throat> that's on the decline. But I have to tell you, this is a huge crowd here today. You walked into the, uh, the ballroom today. It, the, the opening keynote wasn't held in a ballroom, it was held in a stadium. And it was absolutely packed. And there is a lot of customer, there are a lot of customers here, there are a lot of business partners, a lot of IBMers too. But it was a very energetic crowd. They were, they were excited about what they were seeing. Uh, it, it was a well-staged presentation. It was very coherent. And, and, and very upbeat, and I have to say, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, it, those who would say that IBM is a company on the decline need to come to events like this and see that there's still a lot of customer enthusiasm for what they're doing. And they are very, they've made a lot of tough decisions about this business over the last couple of years, uh, smart decisions, and they're putting a lot of wood behind this big data and analytics arrow, and uh, it, it seems like the message is resonating. Yeah, <clears throat> I've said a number of times IBM has to shrink to grow. And that's sort of exactly what's happening. So I don't get freaked out about the declining revenues. I, I, I as well, I want to see that sort of bounce off the bottom. But to me, the more important thing about IBM, and George, I'd love to get your take on this in terms of specifically where they're putting their emphasis, but is IBM spends on R&D. And, and it's very clear where they're going with their R&D dollars. They, they, they made a zillion acquisitions. They said, okay, let's cobble that together into an analytics powerhouse. Huge bet on Watson. Let's pour money in, into cognitive. So um, then, okay, let's do cloud. Let's buy soft layer. Let's get the blue mix thing going. Let's pour money into that. Let's get the developer crowd. So, so major, major initiatives, you know, and then put in mobile and some partnerships around that. Compare that to some of the other large tech players. HP now is splitting up. You know, what's HP investing in? The machine. You know, Memristor. Um, you know, public cloud, they just killed their public cloud. So, so the, you know, there's, and they don't spend nearly as much on R&D as IBM. Oracle spends a lot on R&D, but it's very focused, you know, on Oracle stack. Okay, fine, I'm okay with that, because they're spending a lot of money on R&D. R&D is the lifeblood of the technology business. If you don't spend money on R&D and you don't have the ability to do M&A, you're going to fall behind, and I think that's what we've seen with, with, with HP. IBM, I think, is in a position where at some point they can grow. But George, so what's your take on IBM's analytics business specifically? That's really what this event is all about. Well, I started the day thinking, you know, there was Blue Mix, which was a little bit after the fact in terms of Amazon as a platform, as a service coming together, and that there were several databases with a little bit of over, overlap on them. but. And, and I also wondered, we talked about this um, when we did the kickoff, like what was up uh, Watson? What did it look like to a d developer? And the thing that I came away with today was that Watson really is pervasive. It has become pervasive since last year. And what was actually really eye-opening was that they're talking about exposing it to developers and even business analysts and end users through something called Workspaces, which was pioneered many, many years ago for data scientists, frankly, and programmers. And now they want to make those as easy to use as spreadsheets. And um, that sort of brings it all together for me. So you have Bluemix, and underneath that you have SoftLayer, you have the databases on top of that, and then you have um, Watson exposed through what's essentially like a spreadsheet, then there's a whole lot of go-to-market stuff after that, but 
take that as a tech stack that's very coherent now. So, I mean, the market has you know a gazillion databases, right? They're exploding. So IBM's got what five of them? You got you know, you got DB2, you got Informix, you got Dash DB, you got IMS, you got Natiza. What it, else? To what be else fair, to be <clears throat> fair, they're doing what Microsoft did, which was Microsoft was on a, a package software release cycle. So for every couple of years, they, you know, another sausage would come out, and you'd call it SQL Server 2012 or 2014. Now they have, I think it's quarterly releases of SQL Server to, on Azure, and then every couple of years they'll squeeze out another packaged version. And that's how IBM does it with DashDB. So they've integrated capabilities from Netiza, they've integrated capabilities from DB2, um, and basically DashDB is the tip of the spear. And so it's not quite as messy as it sounds. But, but I mean, owning a database, is, I mean, there's so many databases out there. There's a lot of open source alternatives. It's, it's not a great growth engine for any company, including Oracle. Uh, it seems to me, uh, you know, Amazon has got has gotten a huge amount of, of uh, coverage over, over reInvent and over all the products they announced there, and just a huge lead they have in the cloud. And people say, well, where's IBM and all that? Well, IBM doesn't have to compete with Amazon in the cloud. IBM's got a coherent hybrid strategy. They've got a good cloud story. They're in the top four. They're going to stay there, and they have to be. They have to be in the race, but they certainly don't have to challenge the leader. They have to have one good coherent story to tell, and I think it's clear that between Watson and the analytics portfolio, they are they are lining up around this analytics as really being the place that, that IBM leads. Uh, and that's as good a, a story as anybody has right now, certainly as good as what Oracle has to tell, and, and maybe as good as what, what Amazon has to tell. I think the question I have about IBM, IBM Analytics is just pulling together all these piece parts. You know, they've done 25 acquisitions in analytics, they have a very fragmented portfolio of different uh, products that are oriented toward different markets, and I don't see a, a coherent message yet about how you sort all those out if you're a customer. I think they're good technologies on their own, in their own right, but you know, why is Tableau able to build the kind of head of steam that they have? Why doesn't IBM own that space? I think they, they are, there are still gaps. They have not really lined these, up, these technologies up in a way that, that, that they all fit together. So we've got, I'm just pulling up the uh, Wikibon cloud forecast for 2015. It's got Microsoft number one, Amazon number two, Salesforce number three, IBM number four. And the reason why IBM's number four is they participate in all those markets. I think IBM said in the last 12 months, in the last earnings call, it said they'd done nine billion in cloud. Now, <clears throat> the way they what count does that cloud mean? I mean, is maybe different than what we count cloud. And I know that what Amazon counts as cloud is 100% what we would count as cloud. Same thing with Salesforce. And I think actually, for the most part, same thing with Oracle. I think Oracle's got a pretty clean accounting of cloud. I'm not sure if IBM's is, is as clean. HP really doesn't have a public cloud, but so their cloud business is, sort of comprises a lot of on-prem stuff. I mean, generally, I think that when we talk cloud, we're talking about public cloud, you know, capabilities. But so, but so, and, and so we've attempted to sort of strip out the kitchen sink stuff, and IBM comes up fourth. Um, this is the forecast for 2015, so it's still to be, ter to be determined because we've got a couple months left in the quarter. Um, but I think IBM does have to be a major player there. Uh, I think IBM's actually looking pretty smart right now getting rid of its x86 business. We were kind of negative about that. Um, but you look at the hard times in hardware, and you look at a company like Dell, who actually is embracing the collapse in hardware pricing. Great, come on into our world. Um, taking EMC and driving you know, its cost structures into the EMC culture. That's going to be interesting to see how that all works out, but I think Dell's the right company to do that because it's unsustainable. You talk about a slow motion collapse in infrastructure, software pricing, same thing's happening with hardware. Right. Um, so IBM, somebody said on theCUBE today, you can, uh, it was the guys from, the guys you interviewed from the, the, the micro factory guys. Oh, the, uh, uh, the uh, car. Local uh, motors. The 3D printed car, yeah. He said he trained under, uh, the CEO trained under Michael Porter, and he said you could either go high volume, low cost, or you can go differentiable. Right. Well, what do you think of IBM's? Yeah, Mercedes or yeah. Volkswagen. So clearly IBM's not trying to, I mean, like, when does IBM ever won really in the volume market? You know, kind of lost in PCs, and, you know, microelectronics, D 
disk drives, those, those are schlocky businesses, and IBM's not a schlocky company. That's a quote from Al Shugart, actually. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's the right play. Uh, Street's not buying into it though, George. But it's so, I mean, I go back to, you know, something I said earlier the, in the kickoff, which is I, IBM's business model is to solve hard problems for big companies and also at high margins. And when they get in trouble, it appears, is when they lose sight of that margin issue, where they thought with PCs that they could maintain high, high uh, margins because they were like, well, why would anyone buy a PC from anyone but us? Um, so yeah. <laughs> to your point about IBM going through a transformation, I mean, just think of uh, a metaphor. Um, you know, you got a caterpillar, curls up, goes into a cocoon, and out comes a butterfly. It's just a little bit of a process, and you know, yes, they'll shrink, but um, you don't measure a company by its revenues. That's, that's not how you value a company. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, a revenue. You've got a lot I mean, of revenue selling, selling dollar bills for 90 cents. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, you're right, and we're, we're seeing that a lot of companies are out there today you know, driving revenue with, you know, dollar, every dollar revenue takes two dollars of expense to get there. Well, that's the that's more relevant metric when you put the two together. I mean, I do like, I think there are times when revenue multiples, when you, when you get a market that's kind of settling down yeah. nicely and starting to throw off some profits, I think revenue multiples are actually a reasonable thing to look at, but they're very misleading when you've got these so-called unicorns that are growing like crazy and not yeah. making any money. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you got, you got guys like, you mentioned Tableau, you got ServiceNow is another one, you know, doing very well Workday. Uh, these guys are not you know, profitable or they're barely profitable companies. It's hard for them because as public companies, they've got to report you know, earnings. They try to earn some kind of profit. At the same time, they've got to grow globally. They've got to invest in R&D, so every dime they make goes back into the business. Uh, and, oh by the way, a lot of that is, you know, they're always reporting non-GAAP. <laughs> they're doing a lot of stuff to, you know, stock options and the like, and, and stock you know, buybacks, not so much these smaller companies. but. It feels like we're in the middle of this transition and something's giving, you know, the Dell EMC acquisition is a sign of the times. And we've talked about this at Big Data NYC last month. I said it was overcrowded, uh, overfunded, and profitless. Uh, Peter Goldmarker, I thought, had a great analogy. He basically, for those of you who didn't see it, he said that, and you remember this, George, I think you did the interview with me. Um, there are a lot of companies that, it looks like the nose of the plane is pointed up, but they're losing altitude. Uh, and when funding dries up, the nose of that plane is going to point down, and it's going to get ugly. And then you're going to see companies like IBM and others who, who are strong at M&A swoop in and start picking up assets. Uh, but the question I have for you, George, is with all this open source, where's the IP? And that's why people complain. The ecosystem complains about IBM and its behavior in open source. We know IBM's committed to open source, but they'll say, oh yeah, but it's insisting on doing its own Hadoop distribution, for example. Um, but that's IBM trying to protect IP, isn't it? Well, I don't know if I'm answering exactly your question, but let me give it a shot. The, the model that people who subscribe to an open source business model believe in is we'll get the design win with the developer typically, you know, someone who downloads it, gets it up and running. And then when we have to um, go to support to put it into operation, or I'm sorry, to go to operations to get this thing up and running in production, then we'll sell them some technology, whether open source or not, that helps them keep it running at low cost. The problem is, if you have a whole stack of different companies who are going to go to IT ops and say, we'll help you keep this running and just buy our little console, you know, you're like in Alice in Wonderland or some kaleidoscope with all these random mirrors, you know, and it doesn't do you any good. And so there has to be consolidation. Um, and I, I go back to, you know, why we see Azure, Amazon, Google, you know, IBM, providing a management framework that others might be able to plug into. Otherwise, the economics of open source, where the value comes from helping people run your software, just won't work. So, IBM of course talks about business outcomes, and we, we of course always want to say, okay, but how do you get there? Um, so, 
we were at Pentaho World a few weeks ago, and we had a couple of customers on. We had FINRA on, we had NASDAQ on, a couple others. And what they were doing, they were taking diverse data sets, Paul, and they were ingesting them into the cloud, and then they, would, they, they built out this sort of end-to-end -end data factory, data pipeline, and they would blend all these diverse data sets, you know, with data integration and, and clean the data, and, and then they would operationalize that data by embedding analytics into their you know, systems and putting access to the analytics, giving access to the end users, you know, this whole citizens analytics thing that we talked about. We said, wow, that's really impressive, it's unique, it's a, it was, Pentao is a really pretty robust platform, the company that Hitachi just bought um, for their Internet of Things play, and we said, the only company that we think has the capabilities to do anything like that is IBM. And the question we had is, but we didn't know how integrated it was. Um, certainly, Pentaho made it sound like it was highly integrated. You know, you talk to our customers, it seemed like it was. How integrated is IBM, um, and, and can you answer that question any better today than you could three weeks ago? Um, yeah, you know, the, the, I did come away with two questions from Pentaho, which is, when someone says they're integrated, it's their definition of integrated, and it sounded pretty integrated. Um, the other one was embedded analytics, which worked for the OLAP cube, but if you needed sort of machine learning or something, you had to sort of slide something else in there, so you lose the collaboration magic between the data scientists. And security was kind of a bolt-on as well. Yes. And, yeah. the, IBM was talking about really sort of cradle-to-grave integration, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head all the levels, but it did appear to go further. The point they made was, the moment you drop out of your integration uh, pipeline into something like Tableau, you know, SNP, all your governance is gone. Now, it's possible that um, Tableau and Pentaho can, you know, do proprietary integration, just the way Tableau did it with Informatica. But um, there's one thing that, that Pentaho did not talk about that, um, that we heard about here, which was data wrangling is not a matter of trying to tie together a, a couple dozen data sources where you would have them coming from operational systems. When we talked to Inhi Cho Su, she was talking about data feeds you know, coming everywhere, externally, internally, when you're talking 100, 200, more, you need machine learning to figure out how they all come together. And there's not too many, there are not too many companies offering that. And, and you're saying IBM has that depth. Paul, I wanted to ask you, for the CIO, CDO perspective, I thought that was an interesting conversation that we had, and, and you were kind of defending the CIO's position of, this really should be the CIO's job, but my question to you is, is, is the CIO sort of narrowed his or her scope and sort of failed to be able to take on that job of, I, I would tend to agree with you, you know, when I started Wikibon, we started with this whole notion of information asset and liability management. That is the CIO, it is your job to manage information, manage it as an asset and protect the company, you know, from liability. That sounds a lot like the CIO, a uh, CDO's job uh, that's, a, that's evolved. So should that be the role of the CIO? Uh, or is it too late? Are they well, just sort of uh, keeping the, a, the analogy, light on the disk drive on? The analogy I made, I mean, uh, the words data and information are interchangeable. So why do we need a chief data officer if we have a chief information officer? Well, maybe it's because the chief information officer is not doing his or her job. That's why I think this is a turning point right now for CIOs. I just uh, got back from a, uh, from a, uh, a conference that, uh, with about 70 CIOs from very large companies, and, and this was an undercurrent that I sense very strongly, that they, they are at a, a point now where they either have to get strategic or they're going to be forced back into a niche where they're just doing infrastructure, and they don't want to do that. But how many CIOs have the skill set, have the time, have the vision to be able to step up and, and deal with data more strategically? I think that's always been a, a, a tough a shift for CIOs to, uh, to make, going back, going back to a couple of decades, but now it's kind of like the, uh, uh, you know, the rubber needs to meet the road, because data finally is strategic uh, to these organizations, and somebody has to define strategic value from that data, and if it's not the CIO, then it's going to be somebody else. 
Well, my, my personal opinion is I think it is going to be somebody else. I think the, C, the role of the CDO is to be a change agent, to help companies get to the data-driven organization. I don't see the CIO doing that. I do see the CIO, however, the imperative is to have a strategic role as a business enabler. The CIO really should be a business person that says, okay, you got to get stuff done. Because everything in business is a project, it's an initiative, and it's got a beginning, and it, it is throw, you know, you got to fund it, and it's got to throw off an ROI, and there's a technology component to it. The CIO, in my opinion, should be somebody who really understands that business imperative and can support and facilitate that business imperative. I see the CDO as more somebody who's really trying to understand how to transform the organization, not that the CIO doesn't have transformational you know, role as well, they do, but specific to using data as a competitive advantage. I don't see that as the, the CIO's well, that's role. That's not the skill set that has gotten CIOs to where they are. Right. I mean, what defines a successful CIO? historically has been budget management, you know, uptime, availability, sti uh, 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 stick, to, you know, stick to the numbers. Uh, Not getting in the way. Don't get in the way. Uh -huh. it, the, the ideally, everything just works and we don't even have to be aware that you're there. So that's what you needed for, for, uh, for, for success. And now you've got this transform the business that really the skill sets don't align very well. Well, and what about the chief digital officer? Is well, that, I, I, just don't think, I just don't think that's happening. Well, should it be happening though? No. Well, right no, Wang I mean, would disagree, would the, right? This, he would come on and say, oh no, the chief digital this officer is obsession is with, with C titles. The no. C title is a corporate officer. It's a very important person. We had the chief customer officer for a while. That was, that was hot. And chief innovation officer. These titles come and go. Uh, I, think, I think CDO may actually have some legs, but I'm not... Yeah. Well, I think it may. I'm not in favor of creating a lot of new C Especially titles. in financial services, healthcare, and government. To me, the, the, the chief digital officer is really the chief strategy officer, right? And it's fine to have, it, or whatever, if, if you want to call it CEO, but the VP of strategy, somebody who runs strategy, and your strategy is to enter the, you know, the, digitiz the digital age and digitize your uh, you know, physical assets. That's a strategy play, you know. Um, now, do you want to put somebody in charge of that for a period of time? Maybe, but is that sustainable? No, because eventually the whole business becomes digital. You know, I'm listening to you guys, and. I think you're answering your, your own questions. Like when you talk about the CIO being responsible for availability and uptime and all those things, to me that means CIO now spells chief infrastructure officer. And when you talk about CDO you know, being the chief data officer, when we talk about, we don't use really the term anymore, the API economy or um, sort of exposing microservices uh, for your for your company, where uh, people plug in and get and deal with your company programmatically, but that's what a CDO would deliver. They would be you would be part of someone else's supply chain. You're a supplier of a d analytic data feed and and data services, and so yes, that's very strategic. That's top line sensitive. Whereas someone who just cares about keeping stuff running is the infrastructure officer. All right, gents, we have to wrap. So um, that's it from day one. Uh, what are you guys looking for tomorrow? I mean, any, uh, anything you didn't see today that you want to hear uh, uh, from tomorrow or any kind of closing thoughts? Let's start with you, Paul. I think we have a great lineup tomorrow. We have uh, uh, Bob Picciano, uh, who's it's huge. He's, he's responsible for this whole business. Uh, he'll be a great interview. We have um, uh, Joel Cauley of uh, Information Insights as a Service. We have Merv Adrian Gar from Gartner, who's on the uh, schedule, and uh, and Jason Silva from National Geographic's Brain Games. I can't wait to wait he's to hear. He's been on that before. Passing. He's going to be great. So, so uh, really good lineup uh, tomorrow. IBMers, non-IBMers, uh, Jim Harris, best-selling author. So I think it'll be a lot of, of variety, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. The only thing I would add is in the areas where we said, okay, so we had questions about nailing them down to specifics, we'll get another, another shot at it tomorrow. Yeah, and um, from my standpoint, I always love the business angle, and uh, I mean, IBM's you know, last public you know, statement was they had a $17 billion analytics business. It's huge. It's been growing 20% a quarter for the last three quarters. This is a 20 plus billion dollar business on the way to 25 to 30 billion. Be a, you know, a third of the company's revenue and a real engine of, of growth and margin because it's high margin business. So uh, I'm really interested in learning more, uh, particularly from Bob Picciano about that. So very gracious with his time, really thrilled that he's coming on and uh, have a good lineup for you tomorrow. So check out ibmgo.com.
IBMGo.com is the digital experience for IBM Insight. There's a crowd chat on there, uh, which we're hosting as part of that site, or you, know, you can get there directly at crowdchat.net slash IBM Insight. Join the conversation, tweet us, text us. Thanks for all the support. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.